Good morning, Yuing Chenwen. So nice to see you as part of this podcast. Thank you so much for making time for us today. Today's topic is top of mind for me. Um, I have two kids and I'm excited to um, for them to learn and use ChatGPT and some of the other AI tools. And you have been in this space for many years and have used many of these models. So we're excited to learn from you today. Why don't you introduce yourself? Good to see you again, Vicky. Um, so my name is Yuying Chen Wen, and my background is more than 20 years of product and technology. So uh, I got started back in Microsoft Windows when Bill Gates was still yelling at developers, and that kind of tells you how far back I go. Um, but for the last decade or so, I've been in ed tech. So uh, I focus quite a bit um, on language learning. So that's where we and played with the early AI models around speech recognition, NLP, natural language processing, and natural language understanding. Um, along the way, of course, I picked up specialization in data and some of the predictive algorithms, et cetera. Um, so that kind of gives me a little bit of a leg up because LLMs underneath is all still language model based. So I feel like I have a little unfair advantage here. Um, but yeah, education is super close to my heart. I'm very excited. And I can see there's a major step function coming of capability change and how we learn and how we educate on everything with generative AI. So super psyched to talk about. So tell us a little bit about the step function and, and how are you preparing your kids for, for this change? <laughs> so the moment, I wouldn't say not the moment it came out, but I, back in December when I started playing with chat GPT and mid journey and Dolly, I, did a class with my uh, my kids. Uh, They're 13, 15, and 17, showing them the capabilities. I actually found some other startups with interesting tools and let them play with it on the creative side. So I am all in on teaching kids what is happening uh, in these tools as fast as possible, because it's literally going to be in their future that they're completely immersed in. So the earlier they learn about it, the better. Um, I think I lost the other part of the question. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's exactly kind of what I was looking for is, is really how we prepare. But then what are specifically some of the tools that you kind of looked into and which tools are, are the rest of us can, you know, teach our kids to use more? Yeah. So uh, chat GPT and Bard by default because they're open and they're free. And they're easy to play with. You can try all kinds of scenarios for my kids, though. Um, on the learning side, I'm very partial to Comigo. That's out of Khan Academy. Um, I mean, Khan Academy is almost a standard now in K-12 education uh, in terms of some of the curriculum and teaching methods, et cetera. So this, uh, the CEO and founder is quite uh, technology um, in terms of his aptitude, very, very high. So Comigo is their AI uh, tutor slash chatbot focused on the educational case. And I've seen a demo, I've played with it, I've had my kids play with it. The best part of this so when ChatGPT comes out, everyone in education kind of said, okay, here's a thing that 24 seven, you can ask any question. It just gives you the answer. Is mm -hmm. this the end of learning? Because why does need, anyone need to go to school and learn? If right. The answer's <laughs> right there. <laughs> All right. Uh, is this the end of education? But so what Conmigo does, and they spent a lot of time internally tweaking is an implementation that acts like a really great teacher or the best tutor that you've worked with who looks at your question, looks at any work that you've done and kind of points you in the right direction of figuring out maybe you had a wrong assumption, maybe there was a step in your work uh, that you veered off of. Um, and, and it's not just math or um, uh, English composition, you can kind of point to things. One of my favorite demos, of course, is uh, around code because I used to code and debugging was not my strong suit, uh, which is why I'm in product. <laughs> where you're like, why, why are my pictures, why is there three of them? I was just doing one and you're just, your, your eyes glaze over as you look at the code. Yeah. Um, but this uh, assistant can actually tell you, it's like, well, okay, if that's your problem, let's see, here's a few variables, which in your code that you said there was a three X two, should any of these not be three X? I go, right. Oh, right. Crap. Yeah. Okay. I, let me fix that. Um, so that particular one 
for education. That's what I have my kids use. That's what I have signed up for for quite a while. And from the moment I saw the demo and got on the wait list and got <laughs> access to it because it helps them figure out where their mistakes are, where their assumptions are wrong, and they it actually helps with their learning. Yeah, so it helps them kind of doing it in, almost in Socrates' method, right? Like it, it does it by asking questions, by exploring, and so potentially they could find other relevant topics and learn about them as they go on their search for the answer. And that is also another one you're just hitting on. I'm like, have you played with Comigo? That's exactly <laughs> one of the other features that I like. It suggests questions and branches of exploration, right? So I try to go, I want to learn about how memory works. Like, okay, that's yeah. really interesting. You know, here's five, you know, areas you can look into and ask about. I'm like, oh, that's cool. Um, but the Socratic method or that capability is exactly the ability that will um, make your interaction with the AI um, the step function or just a little bit better. It all comes down to yeah. how good you are at asking questions, taking the answer and following a thought pattern into better insights, new areas of knowledge, um, and actually honing down into you know what's better, what's worse, and doing the right um, comparisons and debates, et cetera. I can see that would be a dangerous tool for me because I, I can just go down lots of different rabbit holes and I can see how if I continue to discover, I could just sit there for hours just like, oh, wow, I had no idea this is, this was going on. Um, You're describing my day, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, you mentioned something about like memory and how brain works. And I've been always fascinated with this, just about how do we learn and how does our brain actually make decisions? And I know AI kind of works differently than our brains. What are some differences and similarities between how AI maybe does calculations and how we do calculations? So here, the biggest difference is what data we have access to. And um, the uh, I think she's called the chief data or the chief decision officer at Google, Cassie. Um, and she has some great uh, okay. courses online. I was listening to the Making Friends of Machine Learning. And one of the things she reminds us is AI, It, as far as it, its entire world is concerned, it only knows what data you gave it to train on, right? So that's the, what we call the data corpus. So earlier on, the, the AI that we used to play with, the amount of data we and the amount of uh, text or audio that we competed was fairly limited. It's whatever we had had our hands-on that we have proprietary access to, et cetera. The LLMs, the data corpus it has access to is much bigger. I'm not gonna say it's the entirety of what's on the internet, but you, if you think about it in that scale, that is how it develops all its intelligence. Huh. But you and I, big difference, we are right. multimodal, right? Huh. So that means we have, uh, images, videos, sensation, taste, uh, people's emotion. Like, so data and our understanding interpretation is constantly coming in. Mm -hmm. So if you, we, if you think about yourself as an AI, because AI is originally a technology that's trying to replicate what humans can do, we still have much, much more incoming data corpus constantly across all modes. So if you talk about taste and smell, I'm sorry, the computers aren't right. taking that as input right now, right? So we, <laughs> we, so, so if you think about, we tend to think about right now because we see the speed and the volume that AI can execute. We think AI is better than us in terms of uh, its ability to be intelligent and process information, but <laughs> we have a lot more, right? So what AI does differently is. If it does one thing, it can do that a million times in almost a similar time frame. We don't scale that way, right? <laughs> we can have one idea. We can have two. It takes a bit longer to have three. You tell me, give me a million ideas. I'd be like, uh, <laughs> I'm going to short circuit. <laughs> so if you think about that, that gives you a really simple idea of we actually have a lot more information. Our data corpus is much, much larger. So we have better common sense and understanding of the world and certain of these rules than AI does, right? So that's where you see um, 
what I call the AI bloopers when, you know, when they do images and, you know, humans have three hands somehow, you're like, what? Right. <laughs> because they <laughs> actually don't have enough. Yeah. yeah. You're like, wait, I thought it was really smart. Why is it really dumb? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this, this gives you the answer as to it is really smart for a few things. It looks like magic because they can do it a million times in just a short time, which humans don't scale that way. So that's the. <sighs> That's, that's super fascinating. So to your point, so mathematics, right? There's certain formulas, there's math problems like addition. We kind of know one plus one is two, like it doesn't change depending on whether AI does it or we calculate it. So how does that work? So in terms of mathematics in AI, LLMs are bad at math, but there are other AI that's good at math, right? So LLMs under, underlying it is uh, seeking patterns in language. Um, and I uh, heard of one of the Bill Gates uh, talks, which kind of clarified this um, very, very well. He goes, look, if you look at numbers in, in math and in equations, there isn't a pattern that says if four shows up, more likely six is going to show up next. The patterns don't have don't work that way. So which is why LLMs, we interact with it uh, through language. We expect it to understand it the same way, but there's no language pattern to math. Like if I say the word one, if I'm counting and you know I'm counting, maybe two always comes next. But if I'm doing math, it could be, you know, negative infinity or, you know, 3.2 or whatever comes next. So LLMs are not great at math. There's other AI that has the rules of math built in, because you're like, well, you know, all the predictive analytics and how do they do all that's that's all statistics and math and different kind of reasoning behind it. So AI in general can be good at it. There's LLM specialized in language, not in numbers. Interesting. I'm, I'm fascinated with language in general. I speak several languages. I'm sure you do as well. And I, I'm always wondering, does AI how does AI foresee language? Is just another data set when I speak to it, say in Russian versus English, or does it foresee, does it see the commonality between like an apple is this word in this language? Does like, does it draw those lines? So the LLMs do, right? So the LLMs, number one, the data that's underlying is multi-language. It's what's on the internet and the majority of the world across a lot of languages are on the internet. So it does have access to enough data to draw those patterns. If you look at translation, the old Google Translate, which we all like to complain about, right? Uh, oh my God, that is just not how you say it in this language. And if you've ever tried uh, translating in uh, ChatGPT, you'll find that it actually works a lot better. And this is because in the old translation technology, we're taking a sentence, we're kind of breaking it down into components and go, okay, this word in this language is this, this word in this language is this, and then it comes over, which is why it doesn't really make sense because number one, we don't say it this way. Number two, okay. it kind of means that, but not in this context, we wouldn't use that word. <laughs> yeah. uh, but LLMs are drawing uh, patterns and understanding of what you're trying to say. Oh, interesting. And then re-expressing it in a new language. So if you think about how, uh, I'm sure you're more than uh, bilingual. I'm bilingual. <laughs> I'm, I'm native fluency in, in Mandarin and English. Wow. When I quote unquote translate, I restate in yeah. that language to accomplish the same end to make sure you understand a particular point. I don't <laughs> go from word to word and be like, right? Exactly. Or it could be different sentence structure, like different languages have a different sentence structure between subject, right? Yeah. And verb so and if sentence. you're doing multilingual communication, I definitely recommend using the LLMs. Either that, to that's really interesting. Right so now. if I travel to a different country where I don't speak the language, I should really be using ChatGPT or BART to translate instead of Google Translate or some other technology that's, oh, see, thank yes. you. I appreciate yep. that. Yeah. <laughs> Unless the, I used to use it just to identify, uh, is it chicken or beef or something else on the menu? <laughs> Keywords. Yeah, you want to make sure you order the right thing. I know. Or like ask for it the right way, for sure. 
Um, a, a friend of mine just went to Portugal and she's like, you know, I thought I could get around with just knowing Spanish, but Portuguese is actually significantly different. So when I was trying to say things in Spanish, people didn't really understand or where I was pronouncing, I was pronouncing it completely wrong. Um, so it's an interesting thing about language that she noticed. She's like, make sure you don't think that you, you can get around in Portuguese if you know Spanish. <laughs> yeah. So my son just went to Japan. He is also fluent in, in Mandarin. Now we can't understand what's being said, but there's enough kanji characters because the, the root is the same language. Okay. He can in general navigate and not get lost. And it was my same experience there. So it's, yeah, because because languages do derive from each other, and if you're familiar with one source, you can get through it better. Looking at written language, but the hearing um, yeah. is very very different. The audio. And the other thing interesting for me is like the hearing. I can over time, if you are in the place that speaks the language, you can pick up and kind of figure out the general meaning. But the speaking part is much more difficult to come by because, like, to actually say it correctly, even if you can understand it, is much more difficult. What do you think causes that, like in terms of language comprehension? So there's another transference between audio and then to, to text and uh, okay. et cetera. When you know a language well enough, so it does actually map a different pathway in your brain where you're, you're going to go straight from sound to concept. When it's still oh. a foreign language, you have to map the sound to the written and then you're Oh, okay. <laughs> so that's why it takes takes a bit, which is, I mean, that's the key difference between those that learn immersively, which I've known people who didn't learn the language, they dropped into the country for six to, you know, 12 right. months. And as bad as their accent is, somehow they can function. Yeah. Right. It's <laughs> because in the immersive experience, they're mapping whatever the sounds are directly to concept. And there's not a <laughs> a stop oh. along the way in in the visual text that's very interesting i kind of had to this uh, i went to france and i didn't speak any french and i stayed there for a few months and so i had background in spanish but by the end of my three months i could understand french and i can still read it and kind of get an idea but the speaking part was very difficult but i used all my languages like i speak russian and english so i was trying to like whatever helps me translate this word yeah <laughs> Whenever I can kind of map it to another word in another language, I was using every every tool I had. Have you ever tried this thing of if you speak a nearby language, just speak it with the accent of the new language? No. <laughs> so I tell you, so, uh, so my husband speaks Czech, but he doesn't speak Russian. But in okay. uh, yeah. right, the language families are pretty close. Very and close. he discovered yeah. that if he tries to speak Czech, the Russians just kind of like, what are you talking about? And then he was like, hmm, let me try this thing. So he spoke Czech then, and he added a Russian accent on it. <laughs> Interesting. And, they, yeah. they, um, and then some of the major meanings would come across. Huh. Makes sense. So yeah. that, I, but they're, they're very close in their root language. Yeah. Absolutely. Try that. Like, I don't speak Ukrainian, but I can understand certain words again, because of the similarities. Um, but there are words that I have no idea or like Polish, you know, kind of like Czech is very similar. Um, so you can kind of get around uh, even with Greek, which I was surprised when I was in Greece that it actually mm. helped me to have that um, background because some of the words were similar. I, I, and I don't know like how the whole language evolved. I think maybe language evolution is is where we're at now ai has the upper hand right we're like feeding it these languages and all it has to do is map the concepts is that right like yeah pretty much it doesn't have its own do you see ai creating its own language based on everything we uh we feed it and start interacting within itself i think it can i think it's if you ask it to and give it certain rules because um a friend of mine studied linguistics in college and he was a computer science major and i'm like really linguistics he's like no this is exactly like programming languages there's just different yeah. rules the grammars are just underlying rules like you do he's like i can create a new program language programming language yeah i can create a new language and if you just tell uh, ai to go okay create a new language with the following grammar or sound rules um, it can <laughs> yeah, and then it start communicating a language we don't even understand. So soon we'll be learning an additional language in school called the AI language, right? Yeah. <laughs> One of my favorite insights, I actually just heard it 
uh, today and it reminded me of another one is traditionally technology is really favored by people who are more uh, STEM minded, right? Mm, Data, yeah. science, numbers. And then there's the other side of the planet that's much more humanities, language, creative driven. But if you think about LLM and what's underlying it, it's really your expertise around communication and language um, uh. that differentiates how well you use it. This is actually the technology what they say is, this is what will bring the other side of the world into technology, all your humanities, your English lit majors, your creatives um, to come into technology will no longer be kind of this, okay, it's, it's the STEM people that's playing in it. It's funny you mentioned that I was listening to a podcast. I'm looking at colleges right now with my daughter and um, University of Florida actually announced they have an AI institute and every major will have to take a course in AI. So it, it's independent whether you're in computer or an English major or whatever. And I thought, wow, how incredibly powerful that is. Like, because sometimes education system moves slowly, I feel like. And this is kind of a really great path forward because what this chat GPT and BART, what they allow us is anyone can now interact with technology because before you had to, as you know, go to your technology department and explain to them what you wanted to say or do. And then they created a program and half the time we created something that they didn't want them to do, right? Like there's right. lots of jokes around that. Yeah. And then it went back and forth because there was a miscommunication. Well, this allows every business person to really create their own systems, right? Or create their own technology without having to explain it to a third party. Exactly. And yeah, it, it's a democratization of leveraging technology. And I also see it as lowering the barrier to being creative, mm. right? Because I can't draw. I really can't. <laughs> I can't either. But I you like know what? I, I can, I can <laughs> ask Mid Journey to make things. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm actually looking forward to a whole new uh, genre, just a wave of, of creativity. Like all of a sudden the people who can't draw, they're in, if they're in there making images, making movies, making visualizations, um, who knows what, what will come because those are very different brains that's now able to create. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm a creative person by nature. And so for me to have access to all these tools to your point around the journey, I love it. I'm like, wow, I would have never created this, you know, out of this, out of these words and seeing things in new perspective. The thing that I worry as a technologist about, and maybe this is just my background in security, is really around the concept of identity. And right now, identity, human as an identity is like we understand that when I'm talking to you, I know you exist. And I know I'm, I'm talking to you and you're human, you have morals and conscience and we can have a, a great discussion. When I'm online and I'm talking to a, a, you know, a friend, uh, whether it's a Khan Academy friend or a friend that was as part of Snapchat that my daughter and her, co and her friends talk to, um, it's, a di it's a different person. It's not a person. And I think sometimes we miss that because we're not used to that computer human interaction. Because she thinks when she's talking to your, her Snapchat friend, like they have morals and ethics and conscience and all of that is built in versus maybe a large language model with lots of statistical right. rules, which is a very different concept. So how do we identify as we continue to communicate and evolve uh, with computers? With how, how do we continue to like, are you know even that we're talking to a computer or a person and what kind of computer or person are we talking to? So it's, I mean, we're all, we're already close to uh, not being able to identify it. Um, yeah. So when I, if you go to the MIT Technology Museum, they have deep fakes and different things in there and they go, okay, is this one real? Is this one not real? And <laughs> I, I get it so wrong. I'm like, no, I can, it's a video. I, I'm sure I can see it, right? Right, right. Um, it is also good. In, so there's also a lot of AI technology that says it can detect. I don't think it can detect either. No. So I, I think going down the path of trying to detect 
is a, almost an unwinnable situation. I think what we need to focus our resources on is how do we inject those conscience and morals and those rules into all the models. I think that's a, that every little piece that we add in makes it better. That's a worthy effort where uh, it just gets better with every little piece of work. With the other one, you know, there's only one perfect state and we all know from technology, there's no perfect state. <laughs> There's you're no never going to get, yeah, you're never going to get there. That's where I would want us to spend all of our resources to go, okay, here's the sets of morals and principles and conscious that goes in. Yeah, uh, that that's that's super, super important. I agree with you 100%. You know, I spent a lot of time uh, into, in, at Akamai and it's like bot, bot management. Like, how do you manage bots? How do you know it's a, bot, a good bot or a bad bot, which is essentially an automated program, right? And in a way, we don't know. Like, as time progresses, the accuracy of determining that is becoming less and less. And, you know, if we don't start building in those those checks and balances and teaching our kids that, you know, it doesn't have morals. Like if it tells you to do something, you probably shouldn't do it. You should probably question it and see what is best for you. Right. Like, um, that's kind, kind of, of what the, you need the AI equivalent of the, the thing that moms always say, if all your friends jumped off a building, would you do right? it? <laughs> right. That's what my mom exactly. would say. Would you do the same thing? You're like, yes, I would, because it's fun. No, no, you wouldn't. That's the wrong answer. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you know, like that just going back to your comment about common sense, like how do we develop more of that common sense? instead of less, because it's so easy for us to completely say, okay, my car is going to drive me where I need it to go. Uh, my fridge is going to tell me when my food is missing or I need new food. Like, oh, you know, I'm going to know how to learn something because I have the best tutor in the world and Khan Academy, right? Sitting right next to me 24 by seven. So as a human, how do I develop those practical common sense things, because a lot of it, honestly, is like a school of hard knocks. You go in the yard and you play with your friends and they, they hit you and you say hitting is not nice. And you kind of like, you know, you, you, it's like a lot of trial and error. Um, so how do we develop that if everything is automated or so much of things that we develop practical sense from is? So that is actually one of the topics in AI research today, right? Because when people ask the question of what's preventing us from becoming kind of Skynet and AI takes over and kill people for paper clips, um, right? Or, you know, if your best way of protecting human life turns out to be enslaving them and making them do exactly what you tell them to do. Uh, it is yeah. an unsolved uh, AI research topic today because what we're talking about is world and context building with rules that are not always about logic, right? So computers, we've gotten to the point where it's good at logical reasoning. And some of these, they don't necessarily arise from logic. And they, they may not also find it from pattern recognition. We have different morals and principles and what we think is right or wrong across cultures across the world. You know, who gets yeah. to decide? Who gets, which one, which sets goes in and which one dozen and can you get your own version with the one that you agree with um yeah, yeah that is it's a very hard problem it is in ai research um it's fascinating to kind of follow what those researchers are attempting i'll have to if you come across a good paper and you want to share please send it my way because uh it's to me it's a fascinating subject um, we're okay. coming to a close here. This has been an incredibly enlightening session for me, and I hope for our viewers. Is there anything you want to kind of summarize or leave us with today? Um, my favorite use case with generative AI right now is learning. And I am a, a terrible student in school. You, the lecture starts, I fall asleep. I, I don't try to, I fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> but I have a million random questions. Right. So now with ChatGPT, I that's what I spend my days doing. Go, what, what, why, why am I not remembering something? I literally will type something like that and kind of figure out an answer uh, that makes sense for me, that helps me understand how brains work, etc. 
So if all your learning comes from just your own innate curiosity, that's the end all be all of education and learning. And now you have this thing free right there. <laughs> right. Amazing. So- I mean, continuous learning. We'll have to do it. It's not just in school. Like with that, okay, I'm done with school. I'm no, and I, I don't have to learn anymore. But we're gonna keep learning, and we have AI to help us along the way. Thank you so much, Ewing, for the time today. This was an incredible session, and、uh, I look forward to speaking to you again soon. Thanks again. Super fun. Bye. Bye.